What's cracking, big dopes? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another Trade Targets video. This is week six. We're talking sell high, buy low candidates for your 2019 fantasy football season. Season. I'm joined, as always, by my man Noah, at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you are following him. And we are live on Twitch right now. So if you're watching this on YouTube, we do this live each week on Twitch the day before we actually put it out on YouTube. So... If you want some behind the scenes action, maybe we'll answer some Q and A's at the end of the video. Come join us on Twitch as we bullshit and just talk a little bit of extra football or fantasy and George fucking <laughs> George, George in the slack. He goes, no, hit the intro quick. <laughs> I was planning on it. You I was going to tell me fuck, twice. I was going to fucking, I was going to fuck you up on this one, honestly. <laughs> um, so anyway, I had a feeling you were going to introduce me and then just cut right to the intro and I was, I was ready. Literally exactly what I was going to do. <laughs> we fucked up that you said that. Uh, so, oh, we're getting a video lag, huh? Not on my end. It should be good for YouTube. Okay. Um, yeah, I think Zoom is fine. I think OBS kind of fucks up. But anyways, uh, yeah, so we're talking trade targets. We're talking some of our favorite guys who sell high after big performances or to buy low based on their upcoming schedule or what not. So, no, welcome, welcome, bike to the uh, to the the contaminated dungeon. How are we? How is college going? You are a young, growing man. Uh, you're always learning in your in your college environment. Um, I haven't been in school in about five years, so we are we are basically worlds apart. Yeah, I feel like Twitter is like a school within itself, but I don't <laughs> want to say much because I feel like I'm gonna get hit. Like the intro is just gonna hit me right in the face. So I'll, I'll, to you. I'll wait till next week because you already figured out my evil fucking plan. Yeah, I'm like playing checkers out here. I'm two steps ahead, but we'll see what happens during the video. But yeah, life's going well. A lot that of football would, uh, going on. That would actually be chess if you're two steps ahead of me, I believe. Checkers is like a very short-term move. Chess is a long-term move. Um, so that being said, let, let's politely hit the intro. I played myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. So we have six guys that we're going to break down. A few of them are sell high. A few of them are buy low. If at any point throughout the video, y'all are enjoying it, make sure you smash that thumbs up button. All it takes is literally fucking two seconds for you to scroll down below, hit the button that looks like that, come back up and look at our beautiful, beautiful faces. I'm going to kick things off real quick. Real, real quick. Let me scroll all the way down. God damn it. You put all your guys on top. <laughs> okay. First guy. It's like a bunk bed. That's... <laughs> <laughs> First guy that we're going to sell high on, Philip Lindsay would actually probably fit in your bunk bed too, ironically. <laughs> Philip Lindsay, Denver Broncos. Now, he was on our sell high list a couple weeks ago coming off of that big game, and then he followed up that big game with like six fantasy points. We're going to do the same thing this week, right? I will continue to tell you after every big game that Lindsay has, that is a perfect sell high opportunity. If you look at his game log so far, half PPR, eight and a half points, eight and a half points, 27, six. 0.5, 22 and a half. So you're getting a, a crazy, crazy roller coaster. Now, it's exactly the same reasoning that I brought up two weeks ago after a 27-point game is that we know the talent is there. So he's going to have these up and down games, and they're going to be very, very sporadic. But what happens in season-long leagues is those get so difficult to predict when to throw him into your lineup. I mean, at this point, he's probably going to be a flex, and you can't really take him out. But that's not always a that, that that's not great for your fantasy team considering he's had more games of eight and a half or below than he has of more than eight and a half. So he's an okay flex option because he brings you the upside, but he has a lot of lot a lot a lot of down games, and he has not separated himself from Royce Freeman in this timeshare at all. Now he's outproduced them over the last few weeks, but Royce Freeman has outsnapped Lindsay in both of the previous two games, 33 to 28 on Sunday, even though Lindsay outproduced him, 34 to 25 in terms of snaps on the Sunday before that. Over that time span, Royce Freeman has out-targeted Lindsey 8-5, to five, and he has out-caught him 6-5 to five while running 20 routes to Lindsey's 14. So you look at Lindsey, right, and his two big games have come against the Packers and the Chargers, who rank 31st and 30th in run defense per PFF. Uh, only the Kansas City Chiefs rank worse than those two teams. And they both rank very poorly per football outsiders as well. So for those of y'all that are skeptical about the PFF grades, because they have some really fucking weird grading system sometimes, especially with the cornerbacks and stuff, but they are ranked very, very low in terms of their run defenses. So both of the big games that Lindsay has had so far are against two of the worst teams in the NFL in terms of run defense. Now, Royce Freeman has yet to score a touchdown in 2019. 
and I tweeted this out a couple of days ago. He actually leads the entire NFL in terms of number of touches without scoring a touchdown. So he's had 71 touches on the year without scoring a touchdown. So that, that's literally hard to do, and that means he's due to find the end zone eventually, which is going to peel back from some of the scoring that Lindsey's done that Freeman hasn't. Because last year, I mean, they were scoring – on and off. Freeman was a guy that had a knack for the end zone and could get in when they were starting to give him the opportunity. So I expect some of them to start going towards Freeman, taking away from Lindsey's pull, obviously. And again, this isn't an endorsement for Freeman because he's not someone that I want in my lineup, but it's one against Lindsey's consistency. And when you're in a season long setting, a guy like Will Fuller, he's not on the list, but I could totally see him as a sell high guy coming off this ridiculous game uh, this previous Sunday. But consistency is so important in season long because not only like do you have to, you know, not only do you need points week in and week out, but like the sit start decisions become impossible with guys like that. So Lindsay, because he's giving you such a high ceiling on a week over week basis is giving you so many sell high opportunities. So if I were someone that owned Lindsay right now, I would take uh, an opportunity right now to try to move him again, package him up with like a low end wide receiver two or wide receiver three and move up either at running back or wide receiver. So Lindsay, yeah. get him out of here. Yeah, the Broncos remind me a lot of the San Francisco 49ers in the sense that they're running a complete timeshare between the two guys. The only, off the only difference is that offense isn't nearly as good in Denver as it is in San Francisco. They don't move the ball up the field as well. They don't have as good of a, as good of a quarterback. Um, and also that defense, too. They don't give them any advantages on short fields. We haven't seen them sack anybody before. I think week four they logged their first sack. But, um, yeah, San Francisco, we've seen them actually use two running backs quite effectively. And as you said, these games are going to be so sporadic because you don't know who's going to get the goal line touches, who's going to get the receiving work, because we've seen both guys get it up until this point. And they do play the Chargers another time this season. So if you manage to get him for that week, that's going to be a good week for Philip Lindsay. I can just, I can guarantee that. I'm going to guarantee one thing this season, it's that. But yeah, these guys that have these boom games and the rest of them are kind of low floors, as you said, like below eight and a half points, you have to take advantage of it. And we're not saying like Philip Lindsay is an RB3 or RB4. We're just saying the value he has right now is that of something that's going to be higher for the, than it is going to be for the rest of the season on a consistent weekly basis. Well said, Noah. I, I can see you've obviously been going to class. Barely. Uh, another, <laughs> another guy that can fit in my bunk bed is Kyler Murray, five foot eight <laughs> animal from the Arizona Cardinals. And he's a buy low for me in the sense that he's been good this year, but he hasn't had a breakout game. And you look at what he's done despite playing on an offense that thinks it's good, but really isn't. Uh, with a coach that had, the only thing that's going for him is his looks. And even they, they're like a little uh, skeptical. Is that a thing? They're, yeah, they're questionable. They're questionable at best. But um, you look at what he's done so far. He's only one of two quarterbacks inside the top 10 this season on fantasy points scored that has less than 10 passing touchdowns. The other one is Jared Goff, who has seven. Kyler Murray has four passing touchdowns this year. That's it. Like, if you, we haven't seen his ceiling because he hasn't really – had the opportunity to show his ceiling. So over the past three weeks, we've really seen his floor. He's accumulated 189 rushing yards. And if you pace that out to a full 16, just using those three weeks, that's over 1,000 yards on the season. And I know that's not like a fair um, pace because he did have those first two weeks of the season where he didn't run at all. But even if you pace out the full five to a full 16 game season, that's 659 rushing yards. Only 14 quarterbacks of all time have hit that number since 1920. It's like Tim Tebow, uh, Cam Newton a few times. Like, not many quarterbacks have that floor that Kyler Murray has shown despite not running at all over, the, over those first couple of weeks. And if he continues to use his legs like we've seen him do the past, past couple of games in the red zone, um, I think last week was like fourth and two or fourth and three by the goal line. And instead of kicking a field goal, which Cliff Kingsbury loves to do, they ran it in. And Kyler Murray showed that he's, he's able to win in the open field with his legs. And I think that's something we can come to expect over the upcoming weeks. Um, along with just his rushing, his throwing ability is going to eventually like come to fruition and give him fantasy points because right now he's third in red zone throws with 29, second in throws inside the 10-yard line with 15, yet he only has three red zone touchdowns. The next closest guy in terms of attempts with that few of touchdowns is Daniel Jones with 15 red zone throws. So um, there's going to be some positive regression there for him to score more touchdowns in that area of the field. And a lot of it does come down to like Cliff Kingsbury not wanting to take chances. I mean, they've kicked seven field goals inside the opposing inside the opponent's five yard line this season, which is a ridiculous amount when you're in a division with three teams that, like, if they weren't all in the same division, they'd easily be playoff contenders, and a few might be even Super Bowl contenders this season. So as they start to realize they need to win games for Kyler, or for Cliff Kingsbury to keep his job and at least look competent in the NFL, 
they're going to start taking these chances on fourth and ones, fourth and twos on the goal line. Those are going to transition into points. And on top of all this, on top of the volume, on top of him having that upside of a top five quarterback this season, we look at his schedule for who he's played and who he's going to play. Weeks one through five, he faced four really good defenses in Detroit, Baltimore, Carolina, and Seattle. And Baltimore hasn't been great, but they were at Baltimore as the second week of the season. Um, and on the chart, you'll see like they're all orange or yellow, which means that they're not very – they're very tough, especially against a rookie quarterback on points per game. But upcoming, the Atlanta, the Giants. That's, San- it. That's all you need to say was Atlanta. He yeah. just, <laughs> just went up into the top three fantasy quarterbacks rest of season. Yeah, and the only game that I would really avoid is San Francisco, who we saw make Baker Mayfield look like he was a rookie. And um, But other than that, they're going to be either high-scoring games, divisional games, or they're going to try to keep it close. And Kyler Murray has already shown his floor. And right now, that's a QB9. So if you can buy him, I'm not – like, I wouldn't try to sell Deshaun Watson to get him. But I don't think he's all too far behind Watson, even though Watson had that huge game this past week. Yeah, I mean, realistically, all you need to do is look at – his his numbers so far without looking at touchdowns like his touchdown rate right now is a number that we look at typically to you know see if a quarterback's going to progress or regress in terms of touchdown numbers he's throwing a touchdown on two percent of his throws the league average is around four and a half so if he gets anywhere near the league average he's going to end up throwing another 20 to 25 touchdowns passing over the over the remainder of the season you look at his yardage, 1,325 yards through the air, like paced out through five games. If you pace that out to a 16-game season, I didn't do the math right now, but that's probably around 4,400 yards. Uh, his rushing total right now is 206 yards. So we pace that out to a 16-game season is probably around 700 or whatever it was. So if you told me preseason, he's going to throw for 4,400 yards, he's going to run for 700 yards, I'm, I'm, t- I'm taking him as a top five quarterback without a doubt in my mind. The only thing that's not there is the touchdown rate. And of course they keep kicking these field goals and eventually they're going to learn. They're going to start to want to win games. And that's where Kyler comes in. It's going to take one, one game, right? Everyone's waiting on that one explosion game. It's going to happen against Atlanta this week. Cause that's just what we do. We donate these points to fantasy quarterbacks. He's going to throw for three touchdowns and there it is. Everyone's going to be like, okay, Kyler Murray, top five fantasy quarterback rest of season. It's only going to take one game to unlock him. I mean, you look at his, his game logs thus far. Like the last game, he threw zero passing touchdowns, scored 25 fantasy points. The game before that was a shitty game, zero passing touchdowns, 17 fantasy points. So it doesn't matter what he's even doing through the air. The passing touchdowns, when they do start coming in, he will insert himself into the top five quarterbacks like week after week after week. And he's throwing the ball at such a high volume. He's had three games already of over 40 passing attempts. Um, and those are the kind of things that you need to see from quarterbacks who maybe aren't being the most efficient. But if the volume is there, if the rushing is there, uh, things are going to turn up soon for Kyler Murray. I'm telling you, it's, it's going to take – everyone's like kind of down on him now. They want something to happen as soon as he hits that one big game where he throws for three touchdowns or even like multiple scores, right? He needs one more game where he throws for multiple scores, and then people will start talking about him again as one of the league's like best quarterbacks for fantasy. Yeah, and their so, defense isn't really doing them any favors either. They had like long fields, like 60, 70, 80 yard drives to get down the field. And as I brought up the numbers of passes inside the red zone, they're getting to that area of the field. They're just not converting at this point. And with, you know, with Christian Kirk coming back and with this offense hopefully improving a little bit more, especially with these games coming up against soft defenses, like it's not like their offense is awful. I know the first week they look terrible, but they're definitely improving. And it's going to be a blow-up spot for him either in one of these next three weeks because they play three of the worst pass defenses in the league. Yeah, it's really going to get ugly there in Atlanta. I'm not looking forward to it. Um, another quarterback, though, if you're, if you're in super flex leagues, obviously I'm not going to the bank and trying to uh, you know, make too much money on the quarterback because there's no point of trading for quarterbacks in one QB leagues with the waiver wire usually plush. Um, Josh Allen, who I don't have specifically on this list, but he's absolutely another good candidate to buy af- after their buy or even before their buy as another incentive to uh, buy for a little bit lower from whoever owns them right now. But one of his key weapons, John Brown is on this list for me, wide receiver for the Bills. He's been quietly good this year. Um, as long as you're playing in some sort of PPR league, um, you know, he's had his worst game was four for 51. And obviously that's not something you want in your lineup. But if you look at the rest of the games, it's seven for 123 and a touchdown, seven for 72, five for 69, five for 75. He's been extremely, extremely consistent. He just hasn't found the end zone, of course. He's had that one touchdown, but I think all signs are going to point towards a post by explosion for John Brown, just given the actual um, usage that he's seen this offense. Like he's clearly the number one target there for, for Josh Allen and the Buffalo bills. You know, you could talk about Cole Beasley getting targets, but in terms of valuable targets, it's all John Brown. 
He's currently seventh in the NFL in air yards. He has a 34% air yard market share on the Bills. He's quietly 11th in the NFL in receiving yards overall. He has 390 receiving yards, which is number 11 overall amongst wide receivers, on pace for 1,250 receiving yards. And it's not like he's had any explosion games like Will Fuller that put him on crazy pace. He's been consistent week in and week out. So 1,250 receiving yards is his pace. Overall, 22% target share. Again, that's like high-end wide receiver two type usage. Um, He ranks top 10 in the NFL in terms of deep targets, while Josh Allen, on the other hand, is top 10 in terms of percentage of his throws to be deep targets. When you look at the schedule after their bye, this shit is magical. I mean, Miami. They do play in the AFC East, so. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, it's just a given when you're talking about guys in this division. Miami, Philadelphia, Washington, Cleveland, Miami again. So in the span of five weeks, they get Miami twice, they get Philadelphia, they get Washington. Miami gives up the ninth, ninth most fantasy points to wide receivers, which is basically only because running backs – get the entire touch count in the second half of those games. Philadelphia gives up the single most fantasy points to wide receivers. Washington, the second most fantasy points to wide receivers. And we have Cleveland, who's middle of the pack, but they continuously get destroyed by opposing offenses. So I wouldn't be surprised if John Brown went off against them as well. The, the It's just a five-week span where John Brown is probably going to explode given his usage. And it's not like he's getting, you know, three targets a game or catching two or three passes a game. And you're hoping that one of those big ones lands. It's like he's getting these targets over and over and over and over again. And he's getting a lot of air yards. So as soon as he connects with one or two of those, we're going to be looking at John Brown in a a much better light. Yeah, he's not a fluke either. I mean, last year, I think over the first seven or eight games, whenever Flack was at quarterback, he was on pace for over 1,000 yards and like five or six touchdowns. We saw him do it in Arizona. Um, It's just he's been dealing with a lot of injuries throughout his career. But the past two seasons, he's been healthy. And he's with a quarterback whose arm matches his speed and his skill set perfectly. And Josh Allen has been a lot more accurate than he's been in his past. So, yeah, with those matchups and just with the skill set he has in the offense being the number one target, um, I view him similarly to a guy like Larry Fitzgerald that we talked about last week, maybe not as safe of a floor, but he's getting a high target share on an offense that, you know, they like to run, but they're not afraid to throw and they're not afraid to take shots deep. And the volume's going to be there, and that's all you can ask for out of a buy-low candidate who's coming off um, one or two kind of down weeks, but who really has good prospects going forward. Yeah, if you're in a one quarterback league and Josh Allen's on the wire right now, he's someone that I would stash through the bye week because you have a starter. The, those next three games, Miami, Philadelphia, Washington, are all at home too. I love when you can get consecutive games at home for a quarterback because that's it's such a it's such a boost. I, I promise you, over the next three weeks, he's gonna he's gonna be like a top eight fantasy quarterback. So grab Josh Allen if you can. Buy John Brown on the very low because his stock right now is is very minimal considering he hasn't scored since week one. Similarly to John Brown, we have Terry McLaurin, who is the unquestioned wide receiver one in Washington. And I'm not completely sure if people are selling him low right now just because he had three like record setting games where I think he was the Jesus. He, he was like the uh I think he was the only rookie receiver of all time to start his career with like sixty plus yards and a touchdown in each of his first three games. But uh he was out week four, and then this past week he went up against the Patriots, but If you look at this tweet that I have by Scott Barrett, and I'll read it so the people on Twitch can hear if they're interested. Terry McLaurin's day might seem disappointing, but was was actually quite impressive with more context. He was shadowed by Stephon Gilmore on 28 of 34 routes, uh, catching three of five targets for 51 yards. This is just the third time in 22 games Gilmore gave up more than 50 receiving yards to a single player in coverage. So he's coming off a bad game, but did so against probably one of, if not the best cornerbacks in the entire NFL in a game where they were they were underdogs by like 15, 16 points with their third quarterback uh, at the helm and Colt McCoy. And the fact that he could produce as well as he did, I mean, like 50 points or 50 yards isn't like great fantasy production by any means, but doing it against the Patriots um, in a game where like he was a game time decision really because of his hamstring. Um, I think they're on a bye this week or something. No, maybe not. Now but, let's play Miami this week. I fucking oh, love this guy. Terry McLaurin. Oh, bye. Savage. <laughs> But you look at, like, every opportunity statistic in his favor. I mean, he's the only receiver in the league with greater than 50% of his team's air yards. And that might not sound great because it's Washington and, sure, maybe the share of the team's air yards. Did you still have that? Did you check that? Yeah, I think it was, like, 51%. Jeez. But you look at his per-game numbers because he did miss week four. Mm -hmm. Even on a per-game basis, he's number one in the NFL in air yards per game. So even though it's a terrible offense, he's still getting the opportunities up there with a guy like Mike Evans, who I believe is second right now. Um, in air yards so the opportunity is there along with the air yards he has the eighth most red zone targets again in four games the sixth most targets inside the 10 and the 12th most deep targets he has nine deep targets so 
it's not like just because they have terrible quarterback play and they're on a bad offense that they're not getting him the ball in valuable situations. That's exactly what they're doing. He's their unquestioned number one receiver on a team that's going to be playing from behind every week except maybe this one. Um, and just on top of everything, right, if you pace out his games, just the four games he's played and accounting for that triple zero stat line where he sat out, he's on pace for 61 catches, 986 yards, and 10 touchdowns. For a rookie in this type of offense, that's incredible. I know this isn't like a dynasty show, but I'm completely in on Terry McLaurin buying him in dynasty as like a top five receiver for this year. And just in, in a seasonal league, I don't see him finishing outside the top 24 because on right, like right now, he's a top 12 guy on a per game basis. And I don't see that slowing down as long as he's healthy. Yeah, I love Terry. I went back and watched this game um, on Game Pass this morning, actually. The dude is so crisp. And he has such strong hands. I just, man, I wish he was not in the situation that he's in right now. The only thing that makes me nervous is like, the, the two quarterbacks that we saw him actually have chemistry with, right? We saw it with Case Keenum, who is not their quarterback anymore. And then we saw it back in college with Dwayne Haskins. It's like, fuck, neither of those guys are the actual quarterback. So we don't know what we're going to get. Obviously, uh, Gruden's out of there. He's no longer the head coach in Washington. So we might get a little bit of a shakeup. But it's clear that Terry is by far and away the most talented player on this entire offense um, right now. So I'm fine with that. Um, he, he might find his way into my lineup this week in – uh, some of my redraft leagues just because he's going against Miami and hopefully um, actually it doesn't even matter if Xavier Howard shadows him to be honest he's already had so much like tough coverage against him yeah, he's played Chicago he played New England this past week he played Dallas and he still tore all of them up maybe not New England as much and I know his schedule down the stretch is a little bit tough too but we've seen him produce against very good uh, defenses so I don't really take too much too much I don't hold too much weight in the defenses he's going to face upcoming yeah, I mean, he's wide receiver 22 right now, having only played four games. So it's like it, it, this, the floor is there. He's doing it week in and week out. Um, we just need a couple more of those boom games, a couple more of those long, deep shots to connect. I'm all in on uh, Terry McLaurin. I'm, I'm pissed because I had, a, I had a trade on the table in one of my dynasty leagues. I had T.Y. Hilton, and I've been trying to ship off T.Y. Hilton for a long time. And it was I was getting Terry McLaurin, Mike Isicki, and uh, – Someone else, it was like not a big factor, but I had it sitting there for a while and I didn't accept it yet. And I went to go accept it and then the trade was gone. And I was like, fuck. I was like, yo, like resend that. I'll send it through. He's like, nah, Terry. He's like, Terry's, uh, Terry's too valuable right now. I'm going to sell him to the highest bidder. And now I'm at the point where I'm like, I might just flip Hilton for Terry straight up in a dynasty league. Give me those like six extra years and probably the same skill set. So that's where I'm at with Terry. I would probably flip him for T.Y. Hilton, vice versa. Um, at this yeah. very moment. Especially with the age difference in a dynasty league, yeah, I would, I would do that in a heartbeat just because as this quarterback situation figures itself out and their offensive line gets healthy and everything starts to work out, the longevity of Terry McLaurin, I'll take that over T.Y. Hilton. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably about to go back and offer that like ASAP. I'm going to end up having to fucking throw in like a third rounder next year <laughs> to make that deal happen. But that is why you don't sit on trades, people. You fucking make, you make them happen and then, and then you don't look. But Damian Williams. He ain't looking bike. He's got this job. It is his. He is a buy low candidate for me. Running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. First game back from this multi-week injury. He absolutely dominates the backfield work. 34 snaps to LaShawn McCoy's 14 snaps. Carried the ball nine times. Shady did not get a single carry in this game. Damian Williams caught three or four targets. Shady caught two of his two targets. So he outcarried him nine to zero. He out-targeted him four to two. It is his backfield. Um he did almost nothing in terms of production. He only gained, I think, 38 yards on his 12 touches. But that's actually what makes him a good buy low candidate, in my humble opinion, because people are waiting for Williams to come back, right? They're frustrated with him. He was in a timeshare, and then he got hurt. Then he comes back and only puts up, like, four fantasy points, and their owners are probably like, fuck this guy. I'm ready to ship him off for something on the cheap, like Terry McLaurin maybe or John Brown or whatever. Williams has had zero success on the ground this entire year, which is obviously not good to see. But I really don't care, considering – Patrick Mahomes is dropping back on nearly 68.5% of the Chiefs' plays this season. Now, Williams ran 21 routes on Monday Night Football compared, or Sunday Night Football compared to Shady's 10, um, and it had nothing to do with Shady's ankle either. Uh, Andy Reid came out and said it had to do with his pass blocking. He'll clean that up, and I'm not really sure like how you clean up your pass blocking game after being in the, in the league for like 17 years, but I think it's just clear – that Andy Reid prefers Damian Williams. He's a, at this point in their respective careers, Damian Williams is the better talent over uh, LaShawn McCoy. He offers a lot more in this game 
in this offense with Patrick Mahomes and just somebody who's going to dump the ball off a lot, right? And you talk about running, you talk about breakaway speed and passing situations, blocking, especially as a pass catcher. Damian Williams, I think, has proved to everybody this year that he is uh, very, very, very good in the pass catching game. Even Darrell Williams out snap Shady in this one, um, although he didn't see a single touch, which is good because now we know for sure, at worst, this is a two-man committee between Damian Williams and LaShawn McCoy. But moving forward, I mean, we saw – what they want this backfield to be like. And it was all Damian Williams. So I don't think we'll see a split that's that drastic moving forward game to game, but I still think it's going to be Damian Williams, maybe 60%, LaShawn McCoy, 40%, if not even more in favor of Damian Williams. And uh, that percentage of the touches or the snaps or whatever in that backfield is obviously going to be um, very, 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 very valuable going forward. Yeah, it speaks volumes, like no pun intended, that he's getting all these looks despite not being – any like showing any type of efficiency on these touches thus far and coming off an injury like if Andy Reid's going to use him coming off an injury and averaging like two yards per carry as their like clear cut number one maybe not a workhorse because you know there's still guys in that backfield getting a few snaps but mm -hmm. if you're going to be used as the number one in the Kansas City offense the efficiency is eventually going to come those touchdowns are eventually going to follow and production is soon to come behind it because you know, this offense is one that's going to be in the red zone a ton. And we've seen Shady McCoy. I think he scored two touchdowns a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. And, like, that job is going to be his on the goal – not McCoy's, but it's going to be Damian Williams' job on the goal line. He's going to be their pass catching uh, back, especially after them, like, talking crap about McCoy being in the league for, like, 11 years and still not being able to put a body on the defensive end. But yeah. um, it, it's his job to lose. And at this point, I don't see him losing to either one of his backfield mates. Yeah, exactly. I, I just think, like, this game – if there was any signs that this was going to be a committee backfield going forward, like why was the touch distribution so in favor of Damian Williams? That's really good news if you are a Damian Williams owner moving forward. And we have better news for Le'Veon Bell owners moving forward. He's a buy low candidate because if somebody in your league has him and didn't trade for him, it likely means that they spent a first round pick on him and he hasn't quite lived up to expectations or the hype thus far. And I wouldn't really put that on him, right? I mean, they're on their third quarterback after Sam Darnold was kissing whoever the hell he was kissing and uh, Trevor Simeon's ankle got turned inside out. But they're with Luke Falk uh, at quarterback right now, and they've had some extremely tough matchups um, thus far against the run. I mean, the teams that they face, their points allowed to the position are 18th, 28th, 30th, and 31st. And I know that's in part because they face the Jets, but you look at his usage and the amount of touches he's getting and just the fact that they have nobody else in this backfield that has shown any sign of relevance. Like Ty Montgomery was getting a lot of hype in the offseason as somebody who had the same skill set as Bell and was going to be getting the same usage or at least cut into his carries. That hasn't happened. Le'Veon Bell hasn't fallen below an 88% snap share thus far this season. And he's only one of two backs to see 20 or more touches every single game. Not even McCaffrey can say that, which is kind of surprising. But you just look at how good he's been in the face of extreme inefficiency in this offense. I know his yards per carry is like 2.9 or like 3.0, like something pretty terrible, maybe even worse. But he's actually 12th in forced missed tackles per PFF. Um, he's number one in missed tackles on receptions, number seven on missed tackles on carry. So he's making men miss despite them being all up in his face once he touches the ball. And with Sam Darnold coming back uh, this week, they just announced that he's going to be uh, active and playing that's going to open up the offense a bit more because, you know, he's not a guy who's afraid to throw the ball deep to a guy like Robbie Anderson or even spread it out to Chris Herndon, who's now back, and Jameson Crowder. This entire offense is going to open up so defenses aren't going to be able to put, like, 15 men in the box and their coach and all their fans just ready to tackle Le'Veon Bell right off the snap. Um, and as that happens, and combined with the defenses he faces upcoming, he's going to probably eventually return that RB, like, top 10 RB value that you drafted him as in Nick. I'm not sure if you have the schedule opened up right now, but I'm going to ask you a question. What's more beautiful, Zendaya or these Zendaya. upcoming games? Stop. Stop. Okay. Don't. I don't even know how to pronounce her name, but I think I, I, think I nailed it. Um, Honestly, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly either. I'm waiting, <laughs> to, just meet needs... I'm waiting to meet her in person so she can uh, correct me. Or, you know, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I mean, tell me what her last name is because I still don't know if she has a last name or not. It's about to be your Colano. Um, <laughs> If you look at the schedule, right, over the, after week eight when they face the New England Patriots, the ranks against the run for fantasy points allowed, 4, 2, 11, 6, 23, 1, 2, 9, 12. Those are all pretty low numbers. Um, these are going to be games where Le'Veon Bell finally has a quarterback behind center who's going to open things up for this offense. They're going to hopefully be in the red zone a bit more. Um, he's still on pace for over 100 receptions this year, so he's got that high, seal, or that high floor. 
Um, hopefully we get to see that ceiling these upcoming weeks against defenses that, you know, haven't been very good against the run. And I know these next couple of games, it looks like Dallas isn't very good. They're ranked eighth in fantasy points allowed to running backs. I need to switch that uh, chart up. But um, they also just faced Aaron Jones, who tore their face off for four touchdowns this past week. So that's a little bit skewed. I think they were like 22nd or 23rd before this. So maybe don't buy him right now if you need instant production. But if you can afford to maybe get like, like 10, 12 points out of him these next two weeks and just really go on a tear with him down the stretch, I would do that. If not, wait until after week seven when they played the Patriots and just get a beautiful slate of games to end the season. I think you got to buy him now. I think like if there's someone in your league that's really actually down on Bell because he's been playing with fucking Luke Falk as his quarterback, you have to get him now. Like when he – I mean, the, it, there's no running back in the NFL that can succeed even somewhat successfully – with Luke Falk as quarterback. And he has held his own in PPR leagues, at least, um, through that fucking adversity. So with Sam Darnold back in the lineup, I mean, we've had a one-game sample size with Sam Darnold. It was against arguably the best defense in the league, Buffalo, and Bell went over 20 half PPR fantasy points. Like that is, I'm expecting that type of usage. Against New England, he might catch 11 passes or 14 passes or something like that. So it's like I, I expect him to probably go for like three and a half yards per carry in that game and in, in next week's game as well. But the volume is just so high at this point. So if someone doesn't think he's an RB1, basically because they're frustrated with what's happening the last couple of weeks or just the def- dysfunction of the Jets overall, like this team is one week or two weeks away from having their entire offense back with Arnold back, Chris Herndon back, Le'Veon Bell um, finally getting to run behind a competent quarterback. I think things are going to be looking up for this Jets team as, you know, as whatever looking up actually means for, you know, it's a very loose term at this point. But it's better than what's happening in the last couple of weeks. He will eventually have some scoring opportunities go his way. Um, so I think when Darnold's back, I mean, we literally only have a one-game sample size. And, again, it was against Buffalo. They put up 16 points. But, like, it's not like Buffalo's letting up points to any team in the NFL right now. So when they get into that slate of, you know, Jacksonville's not even really a team to be nervous about. Right? Jacksonville, Miami, New York, Washington, Oakland, Cincinnati, Miami. That's a fuck. You know what, Zendaya, I am sorry. But, listen, I'm looking at this <laughs> now and holy shit. Um, I would marry that schedule over over Zendaya. So that is saying a lot coming from me. That schedule is ridiculous. Get him now, even if he has a bad one or two games, you can sit through it because you've already sat through three or four bad games from him. And uh, now's the time to pounce on Le'Veon Bell. The only, only concern I would have for him is that the volume is too high. And that is a great fucking problem to have in fantasy. We're not going to be able to predict the injuries. You're giving a guy 25 touches per game. Um, you know, he's well rested coming off the bye, hopefully. Well, I mean, he's, he had the bye two weeks ago, so he's well rested in terms of like not getting 25 touches and then rushing the ball up the middle every single game and getting hit by the line. He's getting a lot of receiving work being down so much, so he's not taking as many hits as he normally would. But when the Jets start getting a little bit more positive, all right, so that's all we got for today's episode. Again, if you enjoyed, make sure you hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel if you are new, if you want some more exclusive. Big Dogs content, you could head over to patreon.com slash BDGE where you will get a private live stream each week to help you with your start questions. You will get our exclusive waiver wire article. You'll get our weekly rankings as well as access to a community or forum, which we are very active on. So patreon.com slash BDGE. Make sure you're joining us each week on Twitch to live stream with us. Twitch.com, twitch.tv slash Big Dogs Fantasy. Follow my man's Noah on Twitter at FBGod. Follow me at Nick underscore BDGE. And we'll see y'all next Wednesday. Thanks.